Good afternoon, and welcome to this event, this very important event. On behalf of the Center for Jewish Studies, I welcome you um, to an event on anti-Semitism in France, a conversation. I'm Ben Brenner, the Helen Diller Family Faculty Director of Jewish Studies. In conversation today, we have a visitor from France, Mark Weitzman, and our own Professor Ethan Katz. So I'll give a few words of introduction to the two of them, and then turn over the microphone to to them to, to struggle over as they come back here, <laughs> mano a mano. So Mark Weitzman is the author of 12 books, including seven novels. He began a career as a journalist in the early 1980s, becoming editor-in-chief of a cultural magazine and publishing in various outlets, including the tablet where he published France's Toxic Hate, a series reporting on the rise of anti-Semitism in France, and this won the Berman Prize for Literary Journalism in London in February 2015. That series led to a book published in 2018, which has garnered extensive recognition, including several prizes, a book in French. An English version, which differs from the French original, I am told, uh, gives its title to today's event, Hate, the Rising Tide of Antisemitism in France and What It Means for Us. It was published this past March and has also drawn critical acclaim, including selection as the New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice and a finalist for the 2019 American Library in Paris Book Award. In other recent publications, Mr. Weitzman conducted the last interview with Philip Roth in French for Le Monde in May 2018, and after the Christchurch massacre this past April, he published an article in Foreign Affairs called The Global Language of Hate is French tracing the French intellectual influences in the Killer's Manifesto. In conversation with Mr. Weitzman is Ethan Katz, Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at UC Berkeley. Ethan joined us last fall and has already had a big impact here. A specialist of modern Jewish history and the history of France and the Francophone world, Katz's research interests include Jewish-Muslim relations, the evolving meaning of the French Republic, Jews in colonial societies, Holocaust studies, and the interplay between religious and secular in modern Jewish life. His first book, The Burdens of Brotherhood, Jews and Muslims from North Africa to France, received a number of prizes. He has co-edited three volumes since then, Secularism in Question, Jews and Judaism in Modern Times, came out in 2015, Colonialism and the Jews in 2017, and another collection, a special issue of Jewish history. <laughs> He has held fellowships at the Katz Center for, no, no relation, I think, uh, Advanced Jewish Studies uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and at the Hebrew University. He's currently working on a book preliminary, preliminarily titled Freeing the Empire, the Uprising of Jews and Anti-Semites that Helped the Allies Win the War. I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Department of History, the Contra Costa Jewish Community Center, and the AJC San Francisco, who have helped us present today's conversation, and give a special thanks to Etta Heber, without whom such events don't take place. <laughs> this conversation is part of a year-long series, a very important one, of lectures and conversations concerning anti-Semitism that we are putting on. You can find information at jewishstudies.berkeley.edu on other events. The series is part of a broader effort here on campus to educate students, faculty, and the broader community about anti-Semitism in order to combat it. Ethan Katz is playing a leading role in these efforts, and uh, there are multiple outlets for finding out more about these events. Please join me, join me in welcoming our visitor, Mark Weitzman and Ethan Katz. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, for the introduction. Welcome, Mark. Uh, welcome to our audience. Thank you all for coming out uh, this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to dive right into it. We have a lot to cover and want to leave lots of time for questions and discussions. Mark, I see your book as essentially divided into two parts. Uh, chapters one to three sort of take us through a, a sweeping transnational look at a series of characters that you see forging connections, really in ways that seem counterintuitive to many of us, between far-right ideologies and movements and Islamist ones across Europe and the Mediterranean. And the second half of the book is a kind of unfolding of the emergence of Islamist networks in France, and at times even a social anthropology and psychological analysis of these networks and leading individual actors therein. Before we get 
into that. I want to start though with the impetus for the book, which fascinates me and I think will interest many in our audience. And that is that you had a close personal relationship with Philip Roth and that he urged you to write this book. Can you say a little bit about how you came to know Philip Roth and what interest he had in the growth of anti-Semitism in contemporary France? Thank you. Uh, hello to everybody. You'll have to excuse my English. I may have to look for some words at some point. Uh, so uh, to answer the question, yeah. Uh, Philip was a, was a dear friend. I knew him. And actually, the story, uh, my story of uh, friendship with Philip Roth is Connect, somehow connected to this book and to uh, the, the subject of the book. So uh, it's not so far-fetched to talk about him today. Uh, I've, I've met Philip in 2000 and we, uh, we became uh, friends after that and I uh, actually began to go back and forth between Paris and the US because I was tired of the, of the atmosphere in France regarding anti-Semitism especially. Um, in 2014, I, I felt, I could feel that something was rising in France. The situation for the Jews was bad enough since the early 2000s, but in 2014, something you could feel in the air, that something was changing. We didn't have the numbers yet. We had the numbers at, at the end of the year, and we learned that uh, that year you had uh, 800 anti-Semitic incidents for the year, that is to say two, more than two a day for a total Jewish population of 500,000 people, which is simply ludicrous. Uh, I'll come back perhaps later on the nature of these incidents because they, they, they matter. But anyway, uh, in 2014 I, I could feel something was going on and I knew that there was no way I could interest in a French outlet on the subject because nobody would acknowledge uh, the, the, the level of anti-Semitism in the country. So I went to Tablet Magazine and, I, and we agreed upon a five-part series on the subject, and I, and I began to, I, didn't, I wasn't even sure I could write in English, in fact, uh, let alone of what exactly I would write, but I was helped by the events. Uh, three days after I went to Tablet, there was the attack at the Jewish Museum of Brussels, and that made three dead. And uh, so that was my first piece, and the, the, the violence triggered the writing. I knew exactly what to write, and I know how to write it in English, well, immediately. I wrote the rest of the series during the, the summer uh, while synagogues were under attacks in France uh, during the so-called demonstration against the Gaza war and anti-Semitic slogans could be heard in the streets. Now I thought I would leave it at that. The, the series was over by the end of July uh, or, or early August. But then I received a, this email from Philip saying that he had taken the liberty to call his agent and his publisher and that there was a book there which hadn't crossed my mind at all. So uh, I signed a contract in November 2014 with Hutton Mifflin for a book that would be an extension of the series. And I really signed it because I thought it would be easy to write because part of the books was already there in the series and I thought it would, um, it would be a matter of uh, 10 to 12 months to complete it. And I began to write January 2, 2015 and on January 7, there was the massacre at Charlie Hebdo, followed by the killing of the police woman Clarissa Jean-Philippe the next day in front of the Jewish school, and the attack at the Hypercosure of Vincennes uh, the next day. So during those three days of terror, my first thought was, I'm fucked. Because uh, <laughs> when uh, my intuition apparently was right in May, let's say seven months earlier, when I went to Tablet, but intuition was right about what exactly? Because there was no direct connection between random anti-Semitic attacks in the suburbs uh, from regular people, regular Muslim people that were not politically motivated, and planned terror attacks that potentially targeted everyone, but always had an anti-Semitic component in their in the, in their in their uh, in, in their in the, in the action or in, in the narrative with which the killers would justify what they did, so it became the sub, the main subject of the book for me. What was the connection between spontaneous rage uh, targeting the Jews, political terror in which France entered with the with the Charlie Hebdo attack on seven on the on January 7, 2015, and that lasted eighteen months. For 18 months, during, uh, during the time I was writing this book, you had at least uh, one attempted terror attack a week, not necessarily targeting Jews, but always justified by the fight against the Jews and against Zionism. Uh, 
And in addition of all that, you had the rise of right-wing populism. The, 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 uh, the, the, the year 2014 had actually started with the first uh, ch anti-Semitic chants heard in, in the streets of Paris since the 30s. The, the cry was, Jew, France is not yours. And it was not a demonstration set up by Muslims, but it was a demonstration set up by the extreme right. Uh, French, French ca Catholic people, uh, anti-gay rights militant. And when you watched the, those demonstrators in January of that year, uh, when you, they were prefiguring the people that could vote for Trump in this country, for instance. It was exactly sociologically and, and uh, I would say narratively and ethnically, it's the same kind of people. So what was the connection between the three? Uh, that was actually, this was my main question while, while, while I wrote this book in two languages, uh, first in English, then in French. Uh, and with it, it's not, as was said before, it's not the same book exactly, it's not the same narrative, uh, even if it's the same story. And so I tried to, I tried to reflect upon those three issues. Well, I'm just finished by saying that Philip never had the chance to see the final product of the book because he died before that. Uh, we did the last interview together a few months before his death for the for, for Raymond. So I think you're already hearing uh, the level of, of nuance that Mark brings to these subjects. And I can just say, um, you know, I asked him how he uh, writes so well in English. Uh, he doesn't really have an explanation, but I can tell you that the book uh, and its columns at Tablet are very much worth reading, uh, as much for the writing uh, as the content. Now, before we get into your arguments more about anti-Semitism, another question is about how you have this interesting contrast that you try to draw in the opening chapter of the book between different forms of assimilation for Jews in modern French history. Uh, really important for us to understanding the question uh, because it's, it's at the core of things. Now, in order to do that, you focus on your great uncle, Jean-Louis Crémieux Briac, uh, and on your own father. So could you say a bit about each of them and how you think they are emblematic in certain ways of the stories of Jews' complicated relationship to the French Republic and to uh, laïcité, as the French call it, this notion of public secularism? Yeah, uh, there's, there's no good Jewish story without saying where you're coming from and what your family was from, so I thought I would start with this, with that in the book, because it gave me also a good introduction to try to make understand an American reader the specificities of the uh, and the paradoxes of the French uh, Jewish condition in France in, in history. Uh, my great grand uncle, called Jean Louis Crémieux Briac, was a war hero. He was one of the first resistant. Uh, he was also coming from a, uh, a very specific Jewish community, which, which that we in France call. The, the, the Jews of the Popes, the Juifs du Pape. The Jews of the Popes are a southern Jewish community that dates back, in fact, to the Roman Empire. And it was uh, nurtured across the centuries by the, uh, uh, when, the when Jews were expelled from Spain, for instance. Uh, and they developed with time a certain form of uh, idealist secularism that is not exactly connected with what French called laïcité, predates, in fact, the, la the French laïcité. The, 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 the French Jews, the French Jews, the, 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 the Jews from Provence, uh, were, in fact, among the, 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 the founders of the Kabbalah in the Middle Ages. But from the Kabbalah, they evolved in, some, in a sort of Spinozian form of Judaism, and then afterwards, uh, at the, at the, during the Enlightenment, they became more and more secular, and in the 19th century, they became, most of them, socialists. Uh, so, and they were also very patriotic. And they, they in, in, in the 18th century, they did help to promote the ideals of the Enlightenment in France, and, they, and to advance secularism in France. It's not the other way around. It's not secularism that created the Jews, the, the Jewish secularism in the South, it's the Jewish secularism that helped creating the, 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 the specificity of French, what we, what we call laïcité, French secularism. So, uh, so when, when World, World War II erupted and, the, and, and France was invaded and the Vichy regime came, 
The, my my great grand uncle was one of the first to. He was part of the French army. He was caught by the Germans, sent to Germany. He escapes and joined the resistance in London. To make long story short, and he became a war hero. And he, in, in, in my mind, he he uh, symbolizes in this book what's best in French assimilation, the concept of French assimilation. He was he he was totally Jewish even though he could not enter a synagogue. He, it was above his capacity. I mean, we tried, so a cousin of mine and me, we tried to, to, to took him to a synagogue at least for, for Yom Kippur. He, he would practically faint. Uh, so so the, the, there is that. But, but at the same time, he, was, he really fought as a French and as a Jew during World War II. He always said he felt very Jewish, even though he, he, he was entirely secular. Another example is my father. My father was a communist all his life. My father had to hide his identity. He, my father was coming from a very much, much more recent form of Jewishness. Uh, my, my father's family came from Ukraine at the end of the 18th century. And they never really, I mean, they did assimilate, but they also were confronted, my grandfather's generation was had, had to face the Dreyfus case and the rise of, of a terrible anti-Semitism in the 30s in France. And my father's generation had to face the occupation and the need to hide who you were in order to survive. And my, my father became a communist during the war. He remained a communist all his life. He couldn't speak of his Jewishness. For him, it simply did not exist. He would, he would also faint at the, at the only notion of entering, of entering the synagogue, but in a much more pathological way that my great great uncle ever did. So, and I use these, these two figures, paternal figure, if you will, to, to try to uh, make understand the ambiguities of what we called assimilation. The, the way it works and the way it didn't work. And, uh, and after the war, and certainly for my generation, we, we, we Jews were caught in, in this kind of paradox where the symbiosis that had existed between France and the Jews uh, until the, 19th, the end of the 19th century could not be reproduced any longer because of the war. And we inherited of a problematic condition of which we were not necessarily aware when I grew up in the 70s but that became obvious uh, from the 90s on, and even more after the 2000, when, when, when anti-Semitism became a real issue. So moving into that subject, anti-Semitism itself, you started to frame for us already sort of the uh, central question uh, of the book for you in terms of these simultaneous forces. Um, I thought you could start this part by giving us a little more sense of that general argument that you came to in the first part of the book. We tend to think about Islamist ideologies against the West as way over here on one side, and far-right populist nationalism, which frequently today features anti-Muslim uh, ideas, as way over here on the other side. But your book, in a way, kind of really pushes against this because you draw strong parallels and interconnections between certain ideologues and uh, important practitioners of far-right ideologies uh, and Islamist ones. So can you explain some of the linkages that you see and how they emerge, how they've grown, how they've become so lethal today? It's a, it's a huge, it's a long story. I think we're gonna come back on the subject during the talk because it's that, so I'll, I'll make the briefest answer I can right now. But yeah, there are, from the 90s on, France was, in a nutshell, France was confronted with two different tendencies. Uh, one became lethal in France, which was the Islamist one. Uh, the Islamists mostly came uh, the, 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 from Algeria. In Algeria, you had a very, bloody civil war in the early 90s that made, that claimed 200,000 people. Uh, that, were, that was launched by the Islamists. Some of these Islamists had been trained in Afghanistan by bin Laden through uh, underground networks backed by the Saudis that would ship the Algerian men in, in Afghanistan and ship them back in Algeria once they were trained. They, these men were called the Afghans because of their training. 
and they were actually they became the heart of the militia of the uh, Islam the, the the Islamic Front of Salvation that launched the war in the early 90s. It's a it's a it's a it was a, we I don't think we have time to really get into the details of that war, but it it really uh, it, really, it really was terrible. The Islamists would enter villages and kill up to 300 or 500 persons a night, uh, including babies and, and women. And these men were allowed to come to France uh, as, as soon as the 1990s, because the French governments, both on the left and the right, were suspicious of the, of the militaries in power in Algeria and thought that the Muslims were the real deal. They were, they were really representing the Algerian people. And they let them preach. Uh, and we realize now, years later, that most of the terror networks that, took, that began to emerge in, on French territory, whether in the southwest, in the north, or near Lyon, or around Paris, were actually born out of the Salafi networks that were, that were uh, uh, organized at that time in the early 90s. These speeches, this narrative, was very efficient. It was a kind of populist narrative directed toward the suburbs, and it was very efficient. Uh, the, the, the narrative was that uh, globalism was destroying the tradition of the real Muslims. Globalism was the new imperialism brought by the U.S. after the end of the Cold War, and it was it was engineered by the international Jewish banks in order to kill the traditions and to feminize the, the Muslim society and to uh, the, 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 the expression of some of, 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 of employed by the, by the Salafi was, was, was that the democracy of the homosexuals uh, would feminize the, 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 uh, the, the Muslim society and this feminization was a part of a Jewish American plot to kill the real Muslim man. At the same time and in the same country, namely France, you had a completely different kind of narrative that was taking place at the time. This narrative was coming from the extreme right uh, and it said exactly the same thing. It said that since the end of the Cold War, uh, you, you had to pick the nationalists of every country should unite in order to fight the new imperialism and the new society that was taking place on a global scale to destroy traditions, to destroy, tra to destroy religions, and to destroy the family, the patriarchal family. This propaganda was very efficient, and it, 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 was, it was born in France. Uh, it, it had connections in Russia, and it had connections pretty much everywhere in Europe, including in, in one of the places that, were, that became the cradle for the violence in Europe, namely former Yugoslavia. In former Yugoslavia, you had far-right far militants that would go, French far-right militants that could go and fight with the Serbs, and you had guys from the Muslims, cities, that would go in Croatia, fight with the Muslim militias, backed by the Saudis and by Bin Laden. Both came back to France. Uh, the extreme right uh, tendency gave birth to a, some, something that we, some of you may have known, called the Great Replacement Theory. And, and, and of course, the Salafi gave birth to the terror networks. In France, the, 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 all the killers, all of the killers are Muslims. All the killers of the 2000, the 2005, and 2016 are Muslims and, and were Salafi oriented. In the U.S., in New Zealand, and elsewhere, all the killers are white, or most of them are white, and all of them claim uh, that they act according to the Great Replacement Theory. That's a theory that was shaped in France during this time. So that's where that's where I drew my parallel from. Yeah. Great, um, but you also take that parallel farther back, right? Yes. Um, you take those connections farther back, and you trace some really fascinating figures and itineraries. Um, for instance, this uh, this figure Omar Amin, which is the uh, name taken by a former Nazi, Johann von Leers, who goes to Cairo after the war, becomes close to the Nasser. Uh, regime um, going back to the 19th century. One of the central figures in your book is Ismail Urban, uh, who becomes this close advisor to Napoleon III. So I wondered if you could just give us a little sense of one or two of these characters who, in some way, go from uh, aligning themselves with far right colonialist 
or you know, very establishment colonialists to align themselves with anti-globalist uh, jihadists or, or other uh, you know, anti-Semites of uh, a very kind of Islamic uh, connected variety. And they're really these boundary uh, crossers, uh, but it seems like there's an anti-modernism with anti-Semitism at its core that uh, is what they have in common. So can you just say a little more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Entitled, today's anti-globalism has its roots in anti-cosmopolitanism, which itself is the product, the product of an anti-modern current that was born in France in the aftermath of the French Revolution. In fact, it was even born before that as an aftermath of the Enlightenment current. Uh, but it really took shape, it really, it, really, it really took off after the revolution and after the terror in the Napoleon War uh, ended. Uh, the, this anti-modern current is interesting because it is, it is I, I, I argue in the book that it's the, the root for a certain fascination in the West for Islam. The, uh, the, 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 in order to, if you will, as, as far back as the early 19th century, uh, once, the, once people began to realize that modernity, progress, was not exactly a straight line, but you had also a certain, a certain feedbacks and certain problems like wild uh, urbanization, industri in, uh, uncontrolled industrialization, uh, um, uh, things like that, this, the destruction of, tra of the traditional forms of life in the countries. The, 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 the reaction to that crisis of enlightenment was uh, a form of anti-modernism and a nostalgia for what had been there before, namely the blue blood and the aristocracy. Uh, people, people began to look for, in Europe especially, people began to look for alternative solution that would bring back to society a form of spirituality and would, would, would help to solve the questions of the, of the industry posed by, by the Industrial Revolution. Some of those people became socialist, uh, utopist socialist. Some of those people became pro-Muslim uh, because they found in, 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 the colon, in the colonies, in the French colonies especially, a, a, an echo of their preoccupation inside of the reaction against uh, the French Enlightenment and the French colonization and uh, among the Muslim clerics uh, that f also believed that colonization was bringing destruction and, and progress was bringing destruction. You have to remember that the first encounter between the Muslim world and the Enlightenment was with France. So uh, there is that. There is an ambiguity from the very first moment uh, as to what exactly is uh, good and what exactly is bad in what France brings to the Muslim world, uh, uh, first with Napoleon and then with the colonization of Algeria. So anyway, the, 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 uh, the, 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 what we call Orientalism was, in, was the narrative of a fantasy according which you could find in the Muslim world a solution to the problems uh, that were, that were uh, cursing the West. Uh, one of those figures that, 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 that went along with that story was, was Ismail Urban, which was a translator. He converted to Islam, he was a socialist. He converted to Islam and he became a translator for the French army in Algeria. He, he was half crazy. He saw himself as the prophet of the, Muslim, of, of the Muslim people at some point. He did marry a young girl, a young Muslim girl, as a lot of French civil servants did at the time. Uh, and it was part of the attraction to Islam because you could actually marry young underage girls and divorcing them with the blessing of the imams, uh, and which, which is what he did. And, uh, and, and so this guy was the inspirator of what, something that would come to be known as the, uh, the, 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 the Muslim status, the Muslim personal status that would have the per perverse effect of depriving the Muslim population of their political rights. The, the paradox here lies in the fact that uh, to, in order to protect the Muslim traditions against the nefarious effects of modernity, you had to deprive them of their political rights in order, so they could, they could maintain uh, things like polygamy, slavery, and so forth. 
this was a this was a step. I argue in the book. We disagree on this, but I argue in the book that this status was 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 it was made for the upper classes of the Muslim society and the clerics, with no regard of what was happening to the poorest classes of the Muslim of the Muslim society in Algeria, with and with the final result of creating a complete apartheid in the name of protesting of protecting Islam. My second example is Omar Amin. Uh, years later, uh, uh, the, well, Omar Amin is the Muslim name of Johann von Leus, who was one of the fiercest Nazi pro anti-Semite propagandists of, of, of the Nazi regime. He went to Egypt after the war to escape judgment at, at the invitation of the great Mufti of Jerusalem, who was in Egypt in the early 50s. And it's one of the stories we barely know. Uh, it's the, it's the uh, influence of the Nazis upon the Middle East, uh, the, 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 uh, the, and not just the Muslim, the Ba'ath Party uh, that you find today in Syria uh, was founded in the 30s under the, the to, to promote no, no to promote not Islam, but uh, Arab nationalism. And it was a pro-Nazi party. So it's always been, somehow, it's always been around, it's always been there. Uh, Johann von Leers was subsequently uh, uh, appointed by Nasser, who was a socialist, as uh, at the head of something called the Study for Zionism, or I forget the exact name, it's in the book. And it helped to propagandize anti-Semitic ideal, Nazi and anti-Semitic ideology across the Muslim world and across the Arab world. And among other things, it, it translated the protocol of the elders of science. Uh, von Leers was also in, had also a huge correspondence with former Vichy civil servants and anti-Semite French writers, and helped to develop negationism in France also. Thank you. So this gets us, as you alluded to, into an area where we have uh, a little bit of healthy and respectful disagreement. Um, for our audience, you started to say a little bit about Algeria, but uh, for those who are less aware, Algeria was a French possession from 1830 to 1962, in many ways considered the crown jewel, <coughs> excuse me, the crown jewel of the empire, and large parts of it were annexed to France proper. It also was the place from which most Muslims migrated to France uh, for much of the 20th century, and almost the entire Algerian Jewish community came to France in 1962. So it's really central to this story, to this question. Now, as you, you know, Mark, in my book, I've argued that colonialism is one of the central forces that shapes the historical positions of Muslims and Jews in Algeria and mainland France, and that the French state has historically often situated the groups in such a way that made coexistence more difficult. Uh, your book certainly doesn't deny the relevance of colonialism by any stretch, but if I follow you, you see it as more important in the form of a narrative rather than a history that created structural conditions. Is this a fair characterization? And can you just elaborate a little bit more about how you see colonialism operating and where you think maybe some of us go too far in overestimating its enduring importance? On colonialism in Algeria, I won't go too far because it's a different, so it's a different discussion, but I'll say this. Uh, the, the, uh, if colonialism was responsible of the relationships between Muslims, of the degradation between Muslims and Jews in Algeria, uh, how do we explain the fact that the Jews were expelled as soon as the independence uh, began, not just from Algeria, but of, but of every uh, Arab country? Egypt, for instance, expelled its Jews as soon as Nasser took over, and with the help of the former Nazis. Uh, Algeria did the same, and Morocco did the same, and so forth. If we take into account only, if we take into account only uh, the weight of colonialism on the relationships between Jews and Muslims, we can't explain that. Uh, this is my first uh, remark. The second, of course, is that, yes, of course colonialism was important in the, in the shaping of the of the, of, the, of the Algerian society, if only be, because Algeria as a country did not quite exist before the colonization. So, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's important. It's also very important in terms of immigration. And there, an Amer American audience should understand that the, the, the very word of migrant do not have the same meaning at all in the US and in France because of that. In the US, when, when you migrate, you go from the old country, as you say, to the new country, 
and you start afresh, you start a new life. Uh, in France, especially with the migrant workers, it's a completely different issue. First of all, they come from the former empire, so they're not coming from, a, from an old country. In the case of the Algerians, they come from former France. Uh, and they bring with them, they, 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 they migrate out of uh, economical reason. Uh, they bring it so they mo they're mostly poor. Lots of them in the 50s were, were just illiterate. Uh, they, they, they bring with them the resentment of having fought the French, for instance. They come to live among the people who oppressed them and in, certain, in some cases tortured them. Uh, so there is that. And it's, they also come in a country that is bitter of having losing its, its, its former colonies, its former status as an empire. In addition of all that, uh, you have to remember that the, as, soon as, uh, as soon as the independence has started, the French government and the new independent governments in Maghreb made a deal in order to watch over these migrant populations. This deal implied that the, 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 uh, the, the cultural associations of migrants, cultural associations of, of Algerians, of Moroccan and France would be infiltrated by secret police of Algeria and Morocco in order to stop any, to, 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 the goal was, was, was double. In, in, one, in, in uh, one reason was to avoid any dissidency any political uh, involvement up from, from the migrant workers, either in French politics or when they would come back in Algerian Moroccan politics. Uh, the other goal was pure, uh, pure pride. Uh, the, the, the migrant countries didn't see well, didn't, didn't, didn't like too much the fact that part of their population was leaving uh, in, order, in, in, in the former empire. So uh, it, it, it had to, they wanted to stop any attempts to assimilate. Both govern, the French government and the government of the former colonies had the same interest in avoiding the birth of an, avoiding the dynamic of assimilation, if you will. Uh, the result of that was that the migrants in France uh, began to live, and their ch the children of those migrants especially, began to live it with the myth that they would come back one day to the country of origin. The fathers especially would, would have an enormous difficulty to acknowledge that they were in France for good, even when they were. They would always entertain the notion that in the, in the, in the old country it was better. In the old country you would come back one day. And so the children grew up with, between two countries without really belonging to, to one or the other and with the feeling of being humiliated if they decided to belong to France because their parents their fathers, uh, especially, uh, would take it as an insult. So, so this is to me the, the, the real difficulty with colonization. It is to have created a population that, that, that refuses its own history as migrant and therefore has tremendous difficulty to assimilate. And the children were caught in that, in that dilemma in the early, in the early 80s. And the French government didn't help them at all. You had a civil rights movement in the early 80s. I was part of it as a young journalist, and I helped. Uh, I was one of the first journalists who actually went to what we call today the Cité, the suburbs where most of these migrants live. And uh, we began to, we, 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 we worked with them. We, we made a lot of demonstrations with them. And at the time, they were not religious. Most of them were not religious at all. What they wanted was assimilation, civil rights, uh, and, and consumerism. Uh, but the French government, which was socialist and who had very good relations with the FLN, which was, which was a socialist, government, the socialist, the socialist oligarchy uh, ruled in Algeria at the time and was backed by the USSR, didn't see that very well at all. So what they did was to send their, the children back to their so-called origins, namely religion. That was the beginning of the of the, of the problems. Uh, uh, it was the narrative went that these kids had a fantastic story that they didn't know about, which was Islam. So this gets us into some of what's the heart of the second part of the book, I think, uh, 
where these forces of migration and uh, rise of Islamism and the situation in Algeria in the 90s that you spoke a little bit about earlier, where those things kind of collide uh, in France, particularly in these areas, the, the Cité that you just mentioned. Um, now, when you talk about the networks of Islamists that would ultimately help to produce some of the most violent terror attacks of recent years in France, you discuss the emergence of Salafism in France in the early 2000s, which you know correlated very strongly with a rise in anti-Jewish attacks. But if I read you correctly, you want to both underline the correlation and caution against the conclusion that there's a simple cause-effect relationship from the first to the second phenomenon. So can you say a little bit about how Salafism began to attract followers and why you see the matter of its impact on anti-Jewish violence to be complicated? Well, in Salafism, I think I, I already explained a bit of what, what happened in the 90s when they came to France and began to spread a populist propaganda and, and, a certain, and based on pride, pride of being a Nigerian, especially a Nigerian man. Uh, given the story I just, uh, just summarized about the immigration, of course, the youngsters in the cities were especially receptive to that, to that, uh, to that kind of propaganda. Um, I'm, what, I'm say, what I'm saying exactly is that there's no, quite, there's no direct causal correlation but not between the propaganda and the and the and the attacks, but between the random anti-Semitic violence of the early 2000 and the attacks, which is a, di a bit different. Uh, you 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 find, for instance, in the early 2000, you find weird. What what dominates in the early 2000 is, is the weirdness of the attacks of the of the incidents. Um, for for instance, in 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 a train. That between between uh, Belgium and Paris one evening, one one day, the train stopped in the middle of nowhere, and a voice coming from the loudspeaker said that all Jews should go off and change trains for Auschwitz. Uh, you had a lot of incidents like that. Um, you had someone you had someone suddenly jumping over her, his neighbor and and spitting on her face and saying. Dirty Jew, we're gonna burn you. you. I'm gonna burn you. I'm gonna burn you and your son, and so forth. Uh, between neighbors, between people that knew each other for years, uh, you had um, you 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 had a, 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 a woman. I'm quoting, but from memory in, uh, in the book, you have a woman and her daughter walking in the street one day in Nice. All this happened in the in the in the spring of 2014. Uh, the, you, you had a, a woman and her daughter walking. In Nice, but working in the street of Nice, and the girl, the younger girl, had a, a, a Morgan David with her on her, and a perfect stranger approached and slapped her, like that, saying "dirty Jew." No, I mean it. It just happened. The first murder of a of a of a Jew in France happened in 2003, when when the young DJ of 23 called Sebastian Silam was murdered by his childhood friend. Uh, called Adela Mastaibu. They knew each other very well. They had grown up in the same building. They knew each other practically from infancy. And one day, Adela Mastaibu brought his friend in the garage of the building. They lived together, and he stabbed him in the heart, in the throat, and the in the eyes. They truly took the eyes off. Uh, and he came out of the garage yelling, uh, "I killed my Jew. I'll go to heaven." But this guy was not an Islamist. This guy had no political training whatsoever. It was a young kid uh, of no special background, and he was institutionalized. He had a psychiatric condition, so did his mother, and he was institutionalized for, for some weeks. And after some weeks, the, the, the psychiatrist thought that being reunited with his mother would be part of the cure, so he was allowed to go home. He was never tried. And he went back in the same building where he could, he could come across the mother of his victim uh, every day in the stairs, and he did, and he said, I. So these kind of stories uh, happened quite a regular, regularly in France at some point. They were mur some ins murderers, or they were not, none of them resulted in death, but, uh, but they were all marked by sudden eruption of blind violence. Um, and, and so um, what, I'm, what I'm arguing in the book is that there is no direct co 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 correlation, there is no causality between that violence and the later terror attacks uh, that targeted everyone. But there is a connection. What I, what I, 
what I argue is that the, 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 the uh, impulsive blind violence against the Jews is like an alphabet, uh, letters, a letter of hate, if you will, that, served, that were used later on by the Islamist network to build up a narrative that makes sense. Uh, those those incidents were did not make sense in themselves. I mean, they were they were what they were. They were anti-Semitic, of course. But but you they, most of the all of the all of the perpetrators would tell you, I don't know, I, I don't know what I'm not anti-Semitic. I don't know uh, why I did what I did. And it's so they, 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 these bursts of violence are like letters, impulsive letters of hatred that that the Islamist network were able to put together and fabricate. A narrative that makes sense, and and this narrative told you that because of the Jews, you could kill not only Jews but everybody. So what I'm saying in saying that is that because France was so blind, blind for so long uh, toward the, the brutal anti-Semitism in France, it was unable. The country was unable to prevent the terror attacks that came afterwards uh, and targeted everyone. So you start to talk about this alphabet of hate. Um, in chapter five of your book, which is called Words and Blood, you focus a lot on this issue of language and how certain language about Jews has conditioned many Muslims to think and make certain associations. You draw particularly upon a theorist of language named Smain Lachey, who's himself a French Muslim of Algerian origin. So could you just quickly explain his theory and how you see it as helping to account for certain aspects of anti-Semitism in France? Yeah, Swain Lachère actually helped me, to, helped me to understand what was going on. Uh, he, uh, he, he claims that anti-Semitism is a narrative. Uh, it's, a, it's a narrative that's not, that not, not necessarily entirely conscious. An, uh, uh, an act for a violent act can be part of a narrative can say something, it's not just an act, it's also part of the language. Uh, he has this theory according which language is a paradoxical thing. Language is the thing that you try to develop in order to express at best, the best, at best of your ability who you are as an individual. But it's also a collective thing that is being taught to you from infancy and that, trans that through that language, values, biases, and cliches are being transmitted as well. So it's, a, it's two things at the same time. And, and we, you spend your life as a, as, a, as a human being fighting between the part of you that is individual and the part of you that is collective. The, the, the idea that the migrant worker, the, the children of the, of the migrant workers, for, histor for historical reasons, uh, but not just them, uh, because you, you do find a crisis of, of magnitude in the Arab countries themselves, uh, are in, um, among the migrant workers, the, the, these kids, the, the collective story is more important than the subjectivity. There is a given up of subjectivity. They don't, they can't elaborate properly. I mean, everything that they say they are goes through the collective narrative and not as an attempt, it's never an attempt to define who they are as an individual. So because of that, when they want to know who they are, they begin, they begin to learn who the collective language teaches them to love and hate. And so you are what you are because you hate the people that you have to hate because you are what you are. It's a kind of circular reasoning, but it works well. Uh, so, so being anti-Semitic, even, even in a psychotic way, even as the killer of, of uh, Sebastian Salam, you can is an attempt to define yourself as as somebody. That's that's his thesis in a nutshell. So, one of the richest uh, sources of material that you have in the book is the case of Mohammed Merah, the Islamist who murdered a rabbi and three children at a Jewish school in Toulouse in March of 2012. And the Merah case, there's many perspectives on it that are uh, quite striking. Um, I just want to quickly mention a few and give you a chance to elaborate on those. First, you document pretty clearly how much really inordinate attention Merah received in the media in the aftermath of these murders and then 
his death shortly thereafter, and much of that attention was very sympathetic to him, and you see that as symptomatic of a larger problem in terms of how perpetrators of acts of terror are portrayed in the French media. Secondly, the police investigation focused on Mirai, you say, as a, quote, lone wolf, which you also see as typical. And finally, perhaps most fascinating of all, you obtained fairly inaccessible documents from when Mirai's family were talking in prison after his death, and you really use these to open a window onto the wider family and community networks that produce some of the language uh, that you've just been speaking about. Uh, so I, I hope you could just sh share a little bit with us about what is frankly pretty chilling material there. Yeah, the Mara story uh, pretty much prefigures the terror wave that later on claimed uh, 256 person in France in 18 months. Uh, Mohamed Mara killed uh, killed a few, killed three military soldiers in the city of Montauban, and then, uh, and, and then three children and a rabbi at the door of their school in full in full daylight in March 2012. Uh, when he was caught and, and arrested, it was a complete shock uh, uh, in France. The result of that shock was a huge denial. Uh, in he was seen in the. Uh, uh, he was seen on the left as a poor, as a poor kid, as a poor lost kid, and some of the some of the uh, some people in the left went as far as seeing him as a victim. Uh, Le Monde went as far to three weeks after the killings. Le Monde went as far as publishing front page a story called "In the Head of Mohammed Mirror." It was a short. It was a it was a fiction story written by a Franco Algerian writer. Uh, explaining why Mira had done what he did, and basically the explanation was that he was a uh, he was a uh, uh, rebellious kid and a victim of the social system and, and racism. That was it. At the same time, this was the left, At the, and, and people were shocked not so much by the vic by the by the fact that victims were the, the, the victims were children, but by the fact that the killer was a Muslim kid from the French suburbs. He became a hero, in a nutshell. On the right, at the same moment, at the same time, you, the police was very embarrassed by the case because they had fucked up the investigation that would have allowed them to stop Merit before the killing of the Jewish children. They knew it. Uh, and also, everybody was embarrassed by the fact of pointing out Islamist networks in France, which, which was it was totally denied by them that the socialist net, uh, Islamist network would exist at all. So the result of that was an, it was an, intervention, an intervention of the chief of the, uh, of the of French intelligence in Le Monde as well to claim that Mira was a lone wolf. The catchphrase was was picked up by a soci French sociologist, namely a little guy called Olivier Roy, who published three days after the killings a, a, an op-ed piece in the New York Times to say exactly the same thing, even though the investigation was on its way. He, he wrote literally that everybody knew that Mira was not part of any network, and he was not an Islamist. That was published by the New York Times. Uh, we know now, years later, that not only there was an Islamist network, but that the people belonging to the Islamist network went in Syria afterwards. Some of them are very known, the names uh, the, won't probably ring a bell to you, but some people like the Klan brothers were, that became known as members of ISIS later on and helped to plan the Bataclan massacre in 2015. So because, that, that, because of that denial, because of that voluntary blindness, French was unable to stop what came afterwards. Uh, I, uh, I would add that, that the, uh, this blindness hasn't stopped today. It's still on. Uh, now, yeah, I've, I found some documents that I published in the book, a, a, a discussion between the Mohammed Nur's brother, who's considered as one of his ideological inspirators, who's in jail today, and their mother, who's a, who's, who appears in the story like a pure monster. I won't go into detail, but this, this history of the Nur family in itself would be a whole book. Uh, you have everything, torture between brother, incest, whatever. 
And that kind of highly pathological family helps to sustain the notion that it's pathology that's, that's responsible for the, for the murders and not Islamic propaganda. But in fact, when you look at what they say to each other, you realize it is both. It, and you can't distinguish one from the other. The, the, propaganda, the Islamist propaganda is everywhere. It's uh, in, in, what they, in their exchange. They have a mystical vision of the world in which the dead are in the killer, Mohammed Merah, is in heaven and he's having all the virgins with him around him, and uh, and and and, uh, and everybody will. Uh, I don't. I forget the the, sen the exact sentence of the mother, but she says that uh, they have to pray until the end of the world that's coming. Uh, so 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 it's the whole family is fucked up, but it's also a a, a family that's entirely Islamized, if you will. And, and that kind of, what's interesting in those, in those exchanges is it's a, it gives a glimpse, a window on the mental world of those people that are, that are, that are actually uh, living today on French territory. So last question before we open to the audience. Um, this takes us a little bit into the matter of identity politics, which I know you see as really central to uh, the problems we face today and central to the connections between the far right uh, and Islamists. So I thought maybe you could just say a little bit about how you see identity politics operating, uh, particularly in the parallel that you draw between what you describe as a far right populism and an Islamist uh, populism, uh, not only uh, operating in France, but also having uh, major transatlantic implications for uh, the US. Yeah, as I said in the beginning, what the, the common point between the Islamists and the, the right-wing uh, propagandists is the quest for uh, the fight against globalism as a destroyer of true identity. The key word here is true, authenticity. The, the Islamists are, the, the, the Salafists and, and, uh, especially uh, uh, want to get back to what they see as authentic Islam. Authentic Islam is to live like as the prophet used to live in the seventh century. So they have to dress like him, they have to make the same gesture he did, and of course they have to live by the same laws that he lived by in the seventh century. And everything that goes after that is the beginning of the of decadency and miscegenation. And that should be avoid, uh, avoided at, at all costs. Uh, Right-wing propagandists say pretty much the same thing today. They claim that uh, the, 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 the beginning of the end in the West started with the Renaissance era, and uh, it went worse from then on. It, 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 we should go back to the Middle Ages. This is, for, for instance, what says Alexander Dugin, uh, the, the Russian philosopher that came, to, came in France to meet foreign uh, extreme right leaders in the, in the 90s, and has since then become one of uh, Putin's advisors. Uh, the, the, it's also what's, what's say, most of the, 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 the tenets of the uh, great replacement theory. Uh, we need to go back to, but it's also, for instance, what says Steve Bannon. Uh, we need to go back to what makes us real, real Americans, real French, real Muslims, real whatever. And, um, and in the name of that authenticity, you need to destroy the, the modern world by every means necessary. Uh, I, would, I would quote just one guy, uh, Alain de Benoit, who, who's one of the main theoreticians of the, of, the, of the equivalent of the alt-right, actually one of the inspirators of the, of the alt-right here. Uh, he wrote this in, in, a, in a book called Manifesto for European Renaissance. Uh, he said, the true wealth of the world is first and foremost the diversity of its culture and peoples. The West's conversion to universalism has been the main cause of its subsequent attempts to convert the rest of the world. The, Westerner, the westernization of the planet has represented an imperialist movement fed by the desire to erase all otherness. That guy who's coming from the far right, from, from the far right he began as a former fascist in the 50s, he worked with former fascists in the 50s, and he, he has been a supporter of the apartheid uh, in South Africa and of the Algerian Empire in the in the uh, by, in the late fifties, today supports supports political Islam. He's a supporter of Iran. 
he, he was a supporter of, of political Islam as far back as the 80s. Why? Because Islam is supposed to fight the westernization of the world. He's also a supporter of Putin. So, you, 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 and of course he's one of the insp inspirators of people like Steve Bannon today, here. So you see the connection, I and mean, I'm not trying to draw a conspiracy theory, uh, drawing you know a line between all the bad people in the world, uh, because those guys obviously can't stand each other as well. I mean, uh, so it's complicated, but uh, but but they but they all have a common enemy, which is modernity, and the Jews are being seen as the emblem of modernity because the, I, I, my thesis is because of their ability to change. Uh, Jews can be everything, can be many things different. different. They can be, in, uh, th throughout his history, they've been socialists, they've been capitalists, they've been uh, secular, they've been religious, they can be many things, but they remain Jews, somehow. And this plasticity, this of, of, of identity, is threatening for people that are looking for one single form of identity. Um, that's my own explanation to the fact that Jews are being the targeting by all those different conflicting forces today that modernity is at stake once again. I mean, each time modernity is at stake, uh, uh, you can see a rise of anti-Semitism uh, in, in, in Spain in, in the 15th century, for instance, uh, in, in Vienna, of course, in the 19th century. Each time modernity erupts in a, under a new form with new means of communication, you find a rise of anti-Semitism. Because people are looking, are trying to find what's real, what's not real, and Jews are being seen as the embodiment of what's not real, of what's not authentic, because of their ability to change. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, we're going to open things up now for uh, comments but mostly questions from the audience. Uh, in order for that to happen, uh, we're gonna have a system where uh, Ben Brenner is gonna come around with uh, cue cards for people to write down questions, Etta also, uh, and they will bring them up here. So uh, this, this will help us to focus uh, questions uh, and to focus on questions uh, so that we can have as fruitful a discussion as possible. Uh, so we're going to give everybody a couple minutes here. Anyone who's interested in asking a question, please raise your hand, and you'll get an index card. Uh, and then the cards will come uh, up here, uh, and I will do my best to represent your questions uh, to Mark. Um, uh, I may comment myself once or twice as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start with the questions we have, and people can continue to write them. Um, if I remember correctly, Mohammed Merah claimed when he committed these acts to be defending Palestinians. To what extent did that affect the way that he was lauded as a hero? Uh, it did affect him. It didn't. It, it did in a way that the uh, the poor Palestinian rhetoric is a is a tr French trope. So you can hear it in the among the left, especially of course, uh, so, and it's a it's really, it's almost commonplace at this point. You, you can't be rebellious if you're not Protestant, basically, whatever your rebellion's about. So, so of course it helped. That said, it was not the main thing. It was, it was part of the equation. Uh, it, the justification was, of course, that uh, uh, he, he, he uh, Mohammed Mira, as a, as a young kid, saw the pictures of the Palestinians being oppressed or being shot by the Israeli soldiers. And that drew, he drew, helped him to draw a parallel between his situation as a migrant worker, uh, as a child, and the global situation. It was a political education, if you will. So in that sense, the rhetoric was like uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the w w when you want to re rebel, rebel globally, you rebel against what you have near you, but, you, but, it's, a, but, it's, but it's a global revolution, so uh, you're entitled to kill Jewish children because, uh, because it makes you feel part of the world. So th that was kind of part of the, of the equation, yes. Uh, um, uh, yeah. So just continuing in that vein, we have a question also um, 
saying that most of anti-Semitism on its face today is about Israel, but you did not mention Israel. Um, this is obviously uh, a subject in its own right, uh, but can you say a word about how you see Israel fitting into uh, the picture that you've drawn? Well, I, I do and, and I don't. I'm, I'm trying to avoid the subject of Israel because I'm, because I've, I'm talking about anti-Semitism, and uh, anti-Semitism is something happening uh, right now in France in the diaspora, and that's my subject. My subject is not Israeli politics. However, the, it, I, uh, and I don't think, by the way, that the Israeli politics, one way or another, affects anti-Semitism. The, uh, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, ter ter terror wave in France was in 1995 during, during the peace process in Israel. There's no direct connection. However, what affects the rise of anti-Semitism is the narrative that is built around Israel. And I make a big difference between the narrative and what's really going on on the ground. Because there's a common place in France saying that uh, we, we, the, 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 the common place say, is saying that the, the israel palestinian conflict is being imported on French territory. It is not. Uh, what is true is that there's a, the, the violence uses the israel palestinian conflict as a narrative to justify what's going on in France. Uh, and, and this narrative has, of course, nothing to do with the reality, if only because no one knows what's going on. I mean, none of the killers, especially, have ever set foot on Israel or, and, and know what the situation is about, nor even that's the history. So, so in that sense, the israel peasant conflict has nothing to do with what's going on in France, or I would say elsewhere, in, in terms of anti-Semitism. Uh, another way that, affects, that, the, that, the, that Israel affects anti-Semitism is in the right. Uh, for a long time, uh, anti-Semitism was a given in the, in the post-fascist European right. Uh, that has changed after 9/11. There was a, there was always a, there was always a trend of uh, uh, of uh, of conflict after the birth of the Israeli state among post-fascist people, according to which could you be anti-Israeli because you were anti-Semitic, or was it two different things? And in fact, you had in the 70s, for instance, you had a former uh, Vichy civil servant that was a fierce anti-Semite. Uh, responsible for the expoliation of the Jews during World War II, he gave a famous interview to L'Express, who was back then a very important uh, news magazine, and he said both that he, he, Jews were, had never been gassed in Auschwitz, this was a fabrication of the Jews, and that he had a tremendous admiration for the Israeli state. This double mind, this double thing, was emphasized after 9-11, and the extreme right has been split since then between two tendencies. There is one tendency that will tell you that the new uh, 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 wrench of the earth, the people that you have to support in order to fight globalism, are the Muslims because they are, they are the new proletariat of the world, if you will. And if you wanted to, that's, what I, that's the, the extract I quoted uh, one, a moment ago by Yann Benoit. And there's another tendency that tells you that Israel is the vanguard of the new nationalism. And, in that, and, and if so, then you have to support Israel against the barbarian Muslims uh, and, and globalism. And that's a tendency that you can find in France around Marine Le Pen, the National Front. Uh, you can also find it here. For instance, uh, among 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 when, among uh, uh, what's his name, Donald Trump, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> in the circles of Donald Trump. So so, uh, but in France, it's interesting because you can find sometimes that these two tendencies cohabit can cohabit in the same mind, uh, and people go from one to the other. Uh, so, y y yeah. So sticking with the right, we have a couple questions that I'm going to group here. Uh, one is speaking about, can, can you speak about anti-Semitism among native French Catholics, which of course you already spoke a little bit about the Day of Wrath, uh, the march in January 2014. Um, the connected question is whether you see the right-wing movements as posing a greater threat because of the fact that they can capture governments in the West like they have in Poland and Hungary. I don't know whether you want to create a hierarchy of threat uh, between uh, the far right uh, and the Islamists, but, but that's not a question. 
On Catholicism, yes, there is a, uh, one of the questions is, uh, that, that is posed among, even though they, they're not necessarily that aware that they're asking the question, but it's the question that is posed to them. How do you reconcile your reactionary trend with the French history? How do you get over the antisemitism of the Vichy years and of the, of the traditional Catholic uh, policy in France? So, so uh, anti-modernism anti in France today is well and alive. The, it's one of its main figure today is Michel Welbeck, for instance, the writer. Uh, Michel Welbeck has given an interview recently in which he rehabilitated uh, a thinker, a Swiss thinker, and one of the first anti-modern writers, Joseph de Maistre. And, and it's interestingly enough, Welbeck in this interview. Uh, says that de Maistre was anti-Protestant, which he was, but he forgets, purposely, that he was also a fear, the first of the fiercest anti-Semite of the modern age, and he groups, in, and de Maistre actually grouped Protestants, uh, Jews, and Freemasons in a single group that he called the Legions of Satan, that had perpetrated the French Revolution, according to him, and Welbeck purposely avoids that reference, that to, to, to he avoids quoting Joseph de Maistre entirely. Uh, so what they're trying to do right now is to rebuild that anti-modern, anti-democratic tradition by bypassing the anti-Semite element, if you will, and Israel is very useful for that. Because they can claim that they support Israel, uh, so but supporting Israel is the sign in their minds that they are not anti-Semite, uh, even though they are, in fact, once you begin to. One of, one, another good example of that is, for instance, of Renaud Camus, the essayist Renaud Camus. Renaud Camus is the guy who actually wrote the first book on the great, on the great replacement theory. Uh, he's considered today as anti-Muslim and pro-Israel. When I exposed him the first time in 2000, he was, I exposed him because of his anti-Semitic writings, uh, which he never, he never really denied. So, so, uh, so, so it, the two can go, the two can co coexist. Uh, what's the second question? Is the, the far right the most dangerous because they could take governments over? Oh, uh, well, we we are facing a global wave of populism today, and I tend to see Islamism as the Muslim form of populism. It's the form. It's, it's the form that populism takes in the Muslim world. Islamism, political Islam. So in that sense, if you see it that way, uh, it's only one thing. Is one more dangerous than the other? Obviously, the, the, Muslim, the Muslim Arabic world today is, is in complete turmoil. It is more than dangerous. It's exploding every other day. So, so in, in a short time scale, obviously, the Muslim issue is, 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 comp is very dangerous. Uh, that said, What's going on today in the West is paving the way for real problems. So uh, in the long term, I don't know, the killers, the, the Tree of Life synagogue killer, the, the Poe killer, the Christ Church killer, both killed Muslims and Jews, both in the names of the Great Replacement Theory. Uh, so they, they, they quoted each other, they claimed the same theory, uh, and and so, so who's more dangerous? Uh, do we are we really sure that these people don't have hairs that they're not going to take arms at some point? Uh, I don't know. So I'm going to group a, a few questions again. Um, we have a few questions here related to uh, sort of trends within Jews and Jews' historical relationship to Muslims. So one question is about what role you see the different experiences, things really that I wrote about in my book of Jews and Muslims integrating and immigrating, what role you see that, if any, playing uh, in this story. Um, and also another question about the existence of anti-Muslim bias among Jews in France or historically in North Africa, whether that figures at all into your analysis. Well, the anti-Muslim bias among Jews um, today, among Sephardic Jews and Algerian Jews especially, is very strong. 
Uh, I, I'm unable to trace back the history of that very, very precisely because I don't know enough about the history of the Jews and Muslims back in the during colonial time. But it's a fact that uh, one of the fiercest polemicists today uh, is called Eric Zemmour, and he's a far right uh, essayist, and he's entirely anti-Muslim, and he's very successful among Sephardic Jews. Of, uh, of, of Algerian background especially. Even though that when you read, B B B um, Eric Zemmour has publicly uh, said that the, the Pétain regime during World War II was good and that the Pétain regime actually saved Jews, uh, which in fact the Pétain regime of course helped deporting the Jews and people like my, my family had to hide from it. Eric Zemmour goes as far as saying that Pétain was a great man and that he protected the Jews. And he, when you read his books, it's the second book especially, it's, it's entirely anti-Semitic. He explains that French, French, Jews in France uh, were, had never, were never prone to defend front, the interest of the country. They, they, were, uh, they were under the influence of the Rothschild Bank that was a foreign bank and, and tried to undermine French interest. This is pure propaganda from the, ninth, from the 30s that he reproduces in his books that are actual bestsellers today in France. Uh, uh, that doesn't stop the, 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 the Sephardic Jews to support him because of his hate against the Muslims. So there is that. So you have a number of questions here on sort of a, a set of forces that you didn't directly allude to in the talk, but I know from our conversations are very much on your mind, and that is the left and anti-Semitism, right? Uh, so if you could say a little bit about how you see the left fitting into contemporary anti-Semitism. Yeah, well, I, I said a few things about it when I talked about Mera. It's clear that the support, the, the enthusiasm, I wouldn't say enthusiasm, it's too strong a word, but this, the kind of critical support he received, if you will, uh, was, was of course coming from the left. There was no doubt to that. Uh, so the, the, the left has been, uh, uh, because of the guilt, because of the because of the, the their incapacity to understand, because of their unconscious racism, the the left is structurally incapable to understand that Muslim people could be also could also hate people because they see them as victims, and victims are victims, and victims are not supposed to be the bad guys. Uh, yeah, just jumping in for one second, you want to define what you mean here by the left because I don't think you mean everyone in the Parti Socialiste or something. Well, I mean, of course, the, the, the leftist groups, but not just the leftist groups. I do mean the Socialist Party, in fact. Uh, the Socialist Party was, was seriously responsible of the, uh, of the coming of the Salafi militants in the early 90s in France. Uh, and uh, they let that territory take place. So yeah, I do mean the Socialist Party. During the Socialist government, uh, uh, the, the head minister of foreign affairs uh, Chesson was his name, claimed publicly that his connection with the FLN in Algeria was a connection of passion, passionate love. The background of that passionate love, of course, was an intense corruption uh, between France, the French elite and the, French, and the Algerian elite. And, and, and after the FLN began to shoot, to send the army to shoot at the protesters in Algeria, the socialists had a real problem because they saw their friends shooting at the people. So what they, how did they react to that? They immediately jumped in favor of the people, even though the people in question were actually led by Islamists. And so they went from being blind in one place to being blind in another place. So I do mean, yeah, I do mean the left in general. Uh, 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 what, what, what was the, the, the rest of the question? Basically, the relationship of the left today to anti to the growth of anti-Semitism, yeah, where, where yeah, it fits into yeah. the story. Yeah, it's basically it's basically blindness. The left is characterized by blindness and cowardice, and by a huge tendency to victimize every every everyone to see the world through an ideology of victimization. So uh, at best, they're they're useless. Um, I would add that in, in the U.S., if I may, if I dare to 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 uh, walk that line, uh, we beginning we're beginning to see some tendencies that I that we French know well, uh, 
uh, inside of the Democratic Party, for instance, in the way that people like Ilar, Ilan Omar are being tolerated despite of what she can say. Uh, I'm still waiting for the condemnation of the Democrat Party uh, after she refused to vote for uh, about the, the, geno the, the, the gen genocide of the Armenians uh, last week, or this week. Um, to, to, as far as I know, nobody has point out, pointed out that Erdogan was a longtime supporter of the Muslim Brothers. And nobody, nobody has asked the question of whether or not Ilan Omar has affinities with the Muslim Brothers, for instance. So, a, a rather provocative question here, shifting gears. Um, Mohammed Merah has declared, says this uh, question, that he intentionally killed soldiers so that his message would be unmistakable, right? We didn't refer to the fact that before the killing of the school in Doodles, he murdered three separate uh, soldiers in, in the 10 days preceding, uh, not, not Jewish. Um, so, the question is why is there an avoidance of this? Uh, Con connection also to uh, the Quran claims the questioner, and why are you calling what he did? Quran behavior with the question. I'm sorry, what? The, the precise wording was Quran enjoined behavior. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. I didn't just simply say Quran. Thank you. And the Quran is not that long a book and might be worthwhile to read it, but continue. <laughs> why? He asks, is this called anti-Semitism when the entire society, uh, he said, is being attacked? Why what? Why are we, why are we just, I got your question here, we're okay. Uh, why is this being called anti-Semitism when the entire society is being attacked? Oh, oh okay, well, well two, uh, uh, two, two answers. Uh, on the Quran, I'm, I'm, I'm not especially, I'm not a theologian, I'm not going to enter a discussion of whether a, the Quran is responsible for what's going on, basically, I think you can you, you can any you can find in any religious book, book whatever you want to find. Uh, so so uh, I and I think it is dangerous to essentialize. Even though today it's true that uh, political Islam is a dominant tendency in the Muslim world, and it does grounds its uh, its rhetoric. On a reading of the Quran, there's no doubt about this. Uh, but I'm not going to enter a religious discussion to know whether it's right or wrong. Uh, the, the 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 reason why this uh, the uh, the I, I tried to explain that during this talk. The uh, why is it called anti-Semite if it attacks if it's if the whole if the whole society is targeted. I try. I tried to make that clear during the talk. The, uh, the, the, the I don't think the terror wave would have would have would have reached that that magnitude in France without the fourteen or fifteen years of uh, spontaneous anti-Semitic incidents that, that took place. I think this, this these incidents prepared, as I said before, they, they were like the the an alphabet of rage that people incubated and learned. And later on, the, the Islamist uh, uh, networks were able to use that these alphabets to fabricate a narrative that tells you that you can kill not just the Jews but everyone because you have started with killing the Jews and because, because killing the Jews is all right because killing the Jews is the Jews are at the roots of all the problems and the society is being basically Judaized. So you can, you're, it's all right that you kill everyone. Mira said something very, very interesting during his talk with the cops before he was killed. He said, the brothers, they told me I could kill everyone. I could kill homosexuals. I could kill people that kiss each other in the streets. Basically, everyone dis disobey the Sharia. But me, I wanted to, I had a message to pass. And I thought that the French would be more receptive if I killed only militaries and Jews. There you go. We have a couple last questions here. Um, an interesting additional wrinkle uh, that someone brings in here is the rise of a radical right-wing uh, Judaism, uh, which I think is unmistakable uh, in, in terms of uh, shifts in Orthodox Judaism. Uh, in the last 20 or 30 years, and basically asking whether you see 
parallels uh, or uh, commonalities with the rise of anti-modernity uh, in Islam. Um, what are the similarities and differences? Again, this is a theological discussion. It's a bit uh, difficult. I will say just one, just two things. Uh, the main difference that there will, I think, always be between Judaism, however orthodox or intolerant tendency, and and Islam, in political Islam, is the is the uh, lack of proselytism in Judaism. No Jew, uh, as radical as he may be, and even even more if he's radical, uh, is going to try to convert the goyim. No, because they're goyim. <laughs> they don't care. So it's. <laughs> So, whereas, whereas the, 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 the Muslims really believe that if you don't convert, if you don't, if you don't submit to Allah, you deserve death. That's the, 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 the political Muslim, the Islamists believe that. So, uh, it's what's behind the polemics on the veil, for instance. Uh, you find, you find, you, 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 you the, behind the veil uh, in France, you have the notion that a virtuous woman should wear the veil. If she doesn't, she's not virtuous. Uh, and she's not virtuous. It's not, it doesn't just, it, but by implication, non-Muslim women are not virtuous. Uh, so, so there is that. I mean, there's, also, there's always a judgment, and that judgment can be at some point uh, uh, implemented. You can act upon that. Um, uh, there is a rise of, of, uh, of radical Judaism, probably especially in Israel, because that's in Israel that the, 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 that the, that the conditions are met for Judaism to become more political. And as soon as the religion becomes political, it's on the way to become intolerant. There's no other way. I mean, especially in monotheism, there's no other option. Uh, once you get political, you have to you have to shoot you you have to to implement the law till the end uh, there's no way that you're there's no moderate religion once it gets political uh, you, you, moderate religion is a, is an apolitical religion uh, that's that's this is why to speak of of moderate islamism is a contradiction in terms uh, and it's 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 also it's the same thing with the with judaism uh, if judaism goes Political, if it becomes a state religion, for instance, uh, then Israel will become like Iran. There's no, there's no doubt in my mind. On that hopeful note, um, <laughs> uh, we, we just want to thank Mark again so much uh, for your time, for your insights, uh, and for this uh, very exciting conversation. Thank you all for being here and for your questions.